So the purpose of today's talk is to discuss social innovation and social entrepreneurship, both in terms of what they are as concepts and how we can enable them in society to flourish. We're going to look at a number of key areas today in the discussion. First of all, we're going to look at definitions of social innovation and definitions of social entrepreneurship. What are they as terms? What do they mean? And how are they socially constructed within society? We're also going to look at the history of social innovation and social entrepreneurship. How did they emerge? How have these constructs and concepts emerged out of society, emerged out of the economy? And how are they actually implemented today? And what are the historical roots of this implementation? And we're then going to look at how social innovations emerge. What are the barriers and enablers to the emergence of, these, of this phenomenon? Particularly around policy, funding, individual motivations, and the role of networks and social capital in that role. We also want to talk about social innovation and social entrepreneurship in relation to our own university and how we implement it on campus, both with students, staff, and in the wider community. We also support social entrepreneurs to become innovative and establish businesses themselves within the university. We want to talk to you about that through our role as an Ashoka U Changemaker campus. So let's move on to the definition of, of social innovation and social entrepreneurship. What do they mean? We discussed earlier that they are socially constructed terms that mean different things to different communities. And what's certainly clear is that there's no singular agreed definition of social innovation or of social entrepreneurship. What is clear is that your understanding of these terms is dependent on your socio-economic, political and cultural context, both personally, within the community that you live, and in your wider region and country. And that's very important to be aware, because when you're trying to facilitate or help innovators or entrepreneurs to come up with their social uh, solutions to problems in society, we need to be able to provide a contextual support environment for them. That being said, there are still some definitions of social entrepreneurship and social innovation that have emerged from academia. And we're going to look at a couple of the key ones that exist today. In terms of social innovation, it has been described as innovative activities and services that are motivated by the goal of meeting a social need. But what do we mean by that? Essentially what we're saying is that individuals or groups of individuals are identifying social problems and then developing innovative activities, services or products to help alleviate those social problems. In terms of social entrepreneurship, it's also been defined as encompassing the activities and processes undertaken to discover, define and exploit opportunities in order to enhance social wealth by creating new ventures or managing the existing organisations in an innovative way. What we really mean here is that it's social innovation but applied through an entrepreneurial lens. We have individuals that are acting entrepreneurially to create ventures or organisations that de deliver surplus to tackle society's social problems. These concepts are very distinct from social enterprise as well and this is a, a point that I would really like to get across quite strongly. That's because social enterprise is an organisational form, albeit one that does deliver social innovation and social entrepreneurship, but nevertheless only a specific type of organisational form. Social innovation and social entrepreneurship can exist within the public sector and within the private sector as well, and are not just specific to social enterprises. Whilst the history of social innovation is all very interesting, I really want to talk a little bit more about the definitions that Richard was referring to earlier. I find it amazing that we have so many different definitions of social innovation. So the rise in social innovation across the world has really been accompanied by the rise in definitions. And I don't think it actually matters which definition you use. I think the fact that there are so many definitions is really, really interesting. I just want to refer to a couple of definitions before I go any further. The first one is from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. The second one is from the OECD. And the last one is from the Open Book of Social Innovation, which many of you may have heard of. As you can see, there are lots of definitions of social innovation, and I'm sure you've maybe seen many more. But I think what's important here isn't the definition. What's important here is you, where you're from, what you do, and who you are. What your community needs is going to be different to what my community needs. Social innovation can fit anyone. It can fit any problems, and it can provide any solution that you need. The important thing is to be socially innovative, but what you choose to do for yourself and the needs of your community is up to you. You choose the definition, you make the difference in your communities. That's what I think matters. 
Social innovation and social entrepreneurship have existed for centuries, of that there is no doubt. We see examples of social innovation and social entrepreneurial behaviour all the way back to the Middle Ages. But probably the most well-documented uh, cases of social entrepreneurship and innovation in society occurred in the 19th century in Victorian Britain. We see examples of the Rochdale uh, pioneers, for instance, who worked in factories and opened cooperative food enterprises to help overcome poor food quality and low living conditions in the towns of uh, Manchester, Rochdale and the North West during that industrial era. However, despite the rise of these social enterprises and the cooperative movement in Britain, along with the rise of charities like Bernardo's during the 19th century, their influence waned in the 20th century as we moved towards a more public sector model that was delivered around a welfare state. This put the state at the heart of delivering all social welfare provision and really put social enterprises, charities and cooperatives to the back burner, really, in delivering those services. However, in recent years, we've seen a move away from that as we move towards what was termed the third way, where the third sector, the public sector and the private sector work together to deliver public services and social good. And this is how we've seen over the last 20 years a massive surge in the number of social innovations and social ent entrepreneurs and social enterprises themselves being established in the UK and globally around. We've heard all about the definitions of social innovation. Now I want to talk to you about some of the companies that we work with that are socially innovative. The first of these is the Community Dental Services. They're all about improving oral health in ever more communities. So originally they were working as part of the NHS, but now they've spun out and set themselves up as a private business. They're employee owned. Everybody who works in the company lives locally and owns a share of the company. The work that they do is dental services. They're going to make profit and then they reinvest the profit in their communities. So they are carrying out dental work, people pay for this, and then they use that money to do things like have a mobile dental van, which goes out to local communities where people find it difficult to leave their homes and treats them there. They also work with groups like the homeless, they go to schools, they work with young people, teaching them about oral hygiene and dental treatments are available for those who can't pay for it. They have a really, really big social impact in their community. All of the employees are completely dedicated to what they do. Their sickness and absence rates are almost non-existent. Everyone really believes in what they're doing. It's this kind of social innovation that can make such a big difference in all the communities that we have. And this innovation is about health. Another social innovation that is also about health, health and well-being, is First for Wellbeing. This is an enterprise that's been set up with the University of Northampton and also the health services in Northamptonshire, the library services and some of the country park services. The idea is to set up a company that's going to provide better health and well-being services for the people of Northamptonshire. So all of these sectors are working together and they are providing a more holistic approach to health and well-being. So instead of people going to one provider and then another for different aspects, they're actually only having to tell their story once and first for well-being are then helping them to improve, hopefully to live a better life. Now the company isn't about profit, it really is aiming to use evidence to use joined up services to actually make a difference to the people of North Northamptonshire and the various different aspects that they are doing. So trying to encourage people to be healthier, to get outdoors more and to actually make a difference to make their lives better. This kind of social innovation will be monitoring the success of it, but it'll be really interesting to see how well it works. And it would be great for Northamptonshire with the University of Northampton at the centre to actually make this difference to people's lives. Goodwill Solutions are a really good example of a local company that was set up to make a difference in its community and has gone from strength to strength. They make a profit and they make a difference. And it's important to realise that social innovation and social enterprise isn't just about making a difference. You also need to make the profits to make that difference. They are a logistics company that was set up by a local entrepreneur who wanted to make a difference in the community where he lived. They are growing all the time and they're working with lots and lots of different groups. Homeless people, ex-offenders, ex-military, long-term unemployed, the kind of people that possibly wouldn't have had jobs in the community otherwise, and the kind of people who would have been on benefits or excluded. 
Now, with a job at Goodwill Solutions, they're learning skills, they're making a difference to their own lives and to the lives of the community. And if you look at Goodwill Solutions, you'll see the profits that they make are reinvested and making a big difference. The emergence of social innovation and social entrepreneurship is a complex and very multifaceted uh, phenomenon. It relies on a number of factors that exist in society and is never down to just one area. Therefore, when you're trying to support social innovation or social entrepreneurs to set up their enterprises, you need to be aware of all of these different factors. But if we boil them down into three key areas, we can say that effectively you have the individual motivation of the social entrepreneur, you have the policy and the funding environment that they exist within, and you have the networks and collaborations that they have within their communities and more widely. And they're the three areas that we're going to look at in today's talk to help you understand how best to foster social innovation. Now these three areas, they all act together within a wider ecosystem that drives a social entrepreneurship and hence leads to emergent social innovation. And there's lots of academic research now that's emerging to show that this wider ecosystems and the social capital links that exist within them are extremely powerful in helping social entrepreneurs to break down institutional barriers and overcome pockets of power that exist in society. But let's look at the social entrepreneurs as individuals first. What motivates them? Well, often social entrepreneurs emerge from the communities that they exist within. And this comes from an empathetic response to the social problems that they see. They share an empathy with their, with their beneficiaries because they're their peers, they're their fellow community members, and they're, they're empowered and they feel it's important to overcome the social problems that they see within their communities. This is very different to what we would call emotional contagion and is what we see in charitable work, where people feel sympathy for beneficiaries and seek to support them. In social entrepreneurship and social innovation, what we're actually seeing is people taking a cognitive, empathetic approach to understanding a problem and how that they can solve it through enterprising means. But we also mentioned the policy and the funding environments that are important for social entrepreneurs in terms of how they constrain and enable their behaviour. In the UK, we've seen a lot of support for social enterprise and social innovation over the last 20 years. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen the third way in policy where they're keen to bring the private, the public and the third sector together to deliver public services and solve social problems. And this has led to the government seeking to support the third sector and support social entrepreneurship and social innovation through the creation of legislation and funding streams to enact that. Some of this legislation has included the creation of community interest companies, which is a specific legal form for social enterprise. It also has included the Localism Act, which empowers local authorities to deal with the requests of the local community in the areas that they feel uh, are of need in their society. Uh, and it also includes the Social Value Act, which actually requires uh, local authorities and public bodies to consider the social value of the services that they commission. But it also includes funding streams. They include the Social Enterprise Investment Fund, Future Builders and Mutual Pathfinders, which have all been established to help loan money to social enterprises and public service organisations seeking to become social enterprises. And this has all created an environment that is designed to foster social innovation and foster social entrepreneurship across all three sectors of the economy. However, across the wider ecosystem, we also have investors and support organisations. In the UK, we have Social Enterprise UK, and we have a number of social investment finance intermediaries charitable and social banks and other funds that are interested in investing in social innovations and social enterprises. Social innovators and social entrepreneurs therefore need to be able to access this wide variety of resources to understand what is available to, out there to them and then be able to go and action that and secure the social capital, the financial capital and the political capital that they need to deliver their innovation. The role of networks is also important, networks and collaboration, and this exists both within the social entrepreneurs or the innovators' own communities, but also, of course, more widely across institutions and across wider society and the economy. This is absolutely key to delivering social innovation and entrepreneurship, and the way that entrepreneurs and innovators utilise these networks in order to access their resources, and as I said earlier, these resources include financial capital, social capital and political capital, is absolutely key. This is a term that's been called social bricolage, the way that effectively the innovator, the entrepreneur or the group of individuals are able to access all of these different resources to pull together exactly what they need to deliver on their innovation, deliver their products, deliver their services or the activity that they've designed. And these networks allow social innovators to become embedded within their ecosystem and within their socio-economic context. But what do we mean by this? Well, society 
is not one singular thing. It's made up of lots of different people, lots of different organisations and lots of different funders. And so therefore, an entrepreneur or an innovator needs to be embedded within all of this to be able to access resources from the different parts of society that they need. This type of bricolage is absolutely key to helping them to overcome the barriers that they face. It allows them to overcome power disparity, it allows them to overcome financial disparity, and it allows them to actually utilise social networks, whether that be through volunteering or actually in terms of connections and networks to contracts and other areas. The development of this social capital within the networks allows the social innovators to challenge the existing dominant power structures, usually within institutions, that exist in society and is absolutely the key reason why they are able to drive transformative change in society. As Richard mentioned earlier, the University of Northampton is an Ashoka U campus. We are all about transforming lives and inspiring change and we work hard to make sure that this is part of everything we do at the university. We've set ourselves up with four change maker challenges which are helping us make a difference in the local community. Through these challenges we are setting up businesses, changing the way we teach, trying to lead with health and well-being and the cultural and heritage traditions in Northampton. Our students and our staff are making a difference in their community in all sorts of different ways. One of the examples of staff who are helping um, make a difference in the community are the First Degree Facilities Company. They manage the grounds at the university and they've recently been doing some work with a local care company asking for their adult learners to come and work with them. So adults with learning difficulties have been at the university learning about the work that First Degree Facilities do. So in the grounds, with the plants, and they've been there one day a week to learn skills and start to become part of a community. The aim of the project is to increase inclusion and hopefully to equip these adults with learning difficulties with the kind of skills that might lead to them going on to get themselves employment. This kind of innovation isn't unusual at Northampton. I just wanted to share with you one of the examples that we're currently engaged with.